I want to shift the conversation back towards that pandemic because, of course, this is what we're dealing with here in 2020. And a lot of questions around herd immunity seem to be at the forefront of where we go from here. As we watch cases rise, there is a hope that potentially more Americans may be floating out there who were asymptomatic, have antibodies. But what does that mean about us trying to get this under control? Well, it might mean we have a lot more to do. And here to discuss that with us is Dr. Howard Foreman. Yale professor and health expert, uh, along with Yahoo Finance's Anjali Kemlani, joining for the discussion. And Dr. Foreman, first, I just kind of want to couch this in the reason why we're all hopeful to get a vaccine here, because herd immunity is the idea that you build up enough defenses around in the community to control transmission and hope that you can slow the spread of the coronavirus. So what's your take on where we're at in that battle right now? Right. So first, thanks for having me on. Uh, I want to just point out herd immunity re refers to that point when a sufficient number of individuals in the community are immune to the virus so that the outbreak can no longer can proliferate. So it can continue to spread a little bit, but it can't uh, continue to grow beyond that point. It'll start to tamp itself out over time naturally once you hit that point. It should be said that with really rare exceptions, we've never seen herd immunity achieved through infection. Herd immunity occurs with vaccination programs. It's how we've nearly eradicated measles, mumps, rubella, polio, uh, and so many other things because we do get to the point of herd immunity. And once you have herd immunity, if somebody comes into the community with measles, they might spread it to one person or two people, but it will not become an outbreak at that point. And mm -hmm. remember, there you're starting from a point of nobody in the community having measles at that moment. What people are conflating here and somewhat fantasizing about is that at some natural point, there will be enough people that have had coronavirus that will presumably develop immunity, which we do believe at least in the short term develops, mm -hmm. and that that immunity will protect them from uh, spreading it to anybody else. And at that point, this will put itself out. And there are a lot of reasons why I think that's a very uh, bad um, you know, fantasy to have because I think it puts us down the wrong path. Dr. Foreman, we've definitely seen some of the uh, resurgences of certain diseases because of a lack of vaccination. So I'm curious on your thoughts on you know, how we uh, overcome that right now when it comes to the coronavirus and also looking at the, the waning of antibodies and how that plays a role in what we can expect. So uh, one thing I, that you emphasize that is so important is that childhood vaccinations must continue. And that now that in most regions of the country, we're at least in a decline in coronavirus cases and in many areas like New York, Connecticut, where I live and so on, it's at a low enough level. We must get our children back into their physician's offices, nurses offices and get themselves vaccinated for their childhood vaccinations because that should be paramount. We do not want to end up with a measles, rubella, mumps outbreak on top of what we have right now. We also must be prepared to vaccinate for flu in the coming months. So vaccinations are critically important. But the, the issue with the coronavirus right now is that there may be pockets that have very, very high prevalence in an area where everybody's immune. Let's imagine that there's a congregate housing uh, in Brooklyn where 80% of the people have been infected that congregate housing might have herd immunity, but it does not protect the people in the next community over. Mm -hmm. So if that housing is in Borough Park and somebody who is currently infected goes over to Bensonhurst in Brooklyn or Sunset uh, Park in Brooklyn and infects that individual there, you're gonna have spread in that new community. There are some communities in New York where previous infection is probably well below 10%, clearly below herd immunity levels. If even one or two cases gets in there and people are not sheltering in place in one form or another, you could see an explosion of cases in one or more communities very quickly. Yeah, so just to drive that point a little further here, I mean, what does that do for, for I mean, we saw how New York's been grappling with this, with calling for quarantine for travelers for 14 days. I assume that must be part of it when we think about even if there is variation within New York, across the country, a lot more uh, a lot more people exposed here in New York just off that first spike. 
So how should we be thinking about more, I guess, travel requirements like that here in the U.S. if we are dealing with such variation across the country? And you say uh, having to hit that 60 to 70 percent true immunity level here. And if it's not just going to happen through community spread, we're going to need a vaccine. So what is the right way forward? So we absolutely need a vaccine. But in the short run, we have lots of measures that function as a vaccine. Some of them include like masking that reduces spread a little bit. Some of it is social distancing. Some of it is reducing the size of crowds inside rooms and so on. But some of it are are things like testing and testing can actually function like a vaccine if you do enough testing and pull people out of circulation before they have a chance to spread to others. So we've gotten very good news in the last couple of weeks. We've learned a lot more about saliva testing. We've learned a lot more about very cheap testing, even if it's lower sensitivity testing. If we can scale up those technologies, and there are a lot of entrepreneurs out there and private firms out there that are doing this, if we can scale them up substantially so that we're doing a few million tests a day, we can use that to modulate the amount of movement that we each have. So maybe we can open up society even more as we test more as well. And eventually we must get to a vaccine. And remember, for a vaccine to work, it either has to be 100% effective on 70% of the population, or it has to be 70% effective on 100% of the population. We know we're not gonna get more than 50% of the population in the first six months, let's say. At best, we would get to a number like that. So we need both the currently infected people who hopefully are immune, combined mm-hmm. with maybe some cross uh, immunity from other coronaviruses, plus an effective vaccine with a lot of people using it to get to a point that might truly protect the larger, quote, herd. Yeah, no, it's a very good reminder here, especially as we continue to track how many Americans might not be willing to take a vaccine, at least as it stands right now, about a third. We'll see what if that changes as we get more uh, guidance from the FDA, as well as research out on these potential candidates. But Dr. Howard Foreman, Yale professor and health expert, appreciate you taking the time along with Yahoo Finance's Anjali Kamlani. Thanks, Thanks again. You. Hey, investors, Zach Guzman here. Are you interested in learning more about the markets and getting the latest financial news? Well, then click right here to subscribe to our Yahoo Finance YouTube channel. Get the latest up-to-the-minute market analysis, big interviews in the world of finance, and information on how to manage your money every day, wherever you are.